that was a, she said, uh, well, maybe it should be a sit down. <laughs> and I thought, yes, yeah, that's, that's probably a pretty good idea because a, a stand that may, may become a fall down. <laughs> no, um, back in 2003 when I was first diagnosed, a uh, light bulb went off in my head and, and it took me down memory lane. Well, memory lane in my case was like a one lane dirt road. <laughs> it, it took me down memory lane and the reason is because I was always a child that was, I guess you could say gravitationally challenged. And anything that took skill or uh, uh, it was just hard for me to learn. If there was balance involved, I, it just, you know, I eventually would learn it. But for, you know, for example, uh, all my friends at seven, eight years old, they'd be out there riding their bikes, you know, and I'd be out there running alongside them, you know, whooping it up like, yeah, this is exactly what I mean to do, and I'm having lots of fun doing it, you know, I'm running and they're riding their bikes. And then, um, when I first turned 15 and got my driver permit, learning how to drive a car was very, very, very challenging for me. Not so much the... Uh, foot part where you 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 know you smoothly accelerate and then you switch over to the brake. I caught on to that pretty quickly. Well, if quickly for you means a year, then I caught on pretty quickly. So no, the hardest part was was the steering because I always thought you had to steer the car like you guys people do it in those uh, bad TV shows in the seventies where it looks like you're trying to fly through a, a asteroid field. And the reason that, you know, everything behind them was straight. They're going down the road really straight. Of course, they passed the same train mailbox 30 <laughs> times, but everything's straight. And they're up there just, you know, jerking the whistle. Of course, I thought that's what you had to do. So the, uh, the driving instructor that year, he should have gotten a medal. <laughs> Probably even a knighthood out of that deal. But I eventually learned how to ride a bike, and I eventually learned how to uh, drive a car. But I was thinking back uh, the, the other day to that exact moment when their, the very first neurologist handed me that gift of ataxia. And I wish I would have asked for a gift receipt because I'd like to return it. You know? uh, and there could be any number, it's too tight too small, mm -hmm. makes my butt look big, mm -hmm. fat, doesn't match my eyes, my shoes, doesn't go with anything in my closet. But you can't, you can't gift receipt, you can't uh, re-gift taxi, and I probably wouldn't even if I could, but um, I've often wondered too if being identified at an early age that you have a gift, and then if you use that gift throughout your adult life, does that mean you've been re-gifting the whole time? And the reason why I ask that is because uh, when I was young, when third grade, it's one of my uh, earliest, uh, fondest memories. When I was in third grade, I used to put on these little pan-on shows or uh, skits in front of the class, and they all basically followed this, the same theme. And the theme was, I'd be this old man, and I was kind of, Falling asleep and fighting, you know how it is when you're really drowsy, but you don't want to fall asleep, you keep fighting. So I got that whole thing going on, right? And meanwhile, the chair I'm sitting on, I'm slowly, every time I fall asleep, I slowly slide up the chair until eventually I hit the floor, right? And then I explode at this big old start, you know, I'm gazing around, wondering what's going on, sputtering, you know, and of course the kids are just cracking up, you know. And, the more the more they laugh, the more I just kind of add lip it, you know, and act silly. I don't I don't mind people laughing at me if I mean to do it, right? So, uh, but I I've, I've noticed too that with my ataxia, with my ataxia comes uh, limited options, and those limited options aren't always a bad thing. You would think that the word limited that that gives you kind of a negative uh, connotation, but those options aren't always negative. Take, for example, uh, running with scissors. I was always told as a little kid, don't run with sharp objects, right? Don't run with scissors. Well, 
thanks to a taxi, that's no longer even an option. <laughs> the other thing is, when I was when I was growing up, I was deathly scared of. My dad raised cows, and he had a couple big steers with horns, you know, and I was just deathly afraid of them. And then I see these clips of these people, insane people, running for the bulls in Spain, and I always thought. No way, I would never do that. Well, again, thanks to a taxi, that's not an option. I can't go straight and do that, right? So, uh, and then the other thing that drives me crazy is when you go into a medical office and they hand you that 30 page document that they want you to fill out, you know, with the little spaces and the little, you know, they want you to put your whole history from the time you took your first breath. Well, I've had. I had my wife fill those out for me. I've had my kids fill those out for me. I've had the nurses fill them out for me because I just I tell them, you know, this is something I cannot do. So they do it. I've even had other people, little kids in the waiting room, <laughs> fill them out for me. That they got done in crayon. <laughs> they got done, so I really didn't care too much. You know? So um, when people ask me what a taxi is like. Unless you know somebody who has a taxi, or you're a psych uh, neurologist yourself, you probably don't understand why. You get these blank looks when you tell people you have a taxi. So over the years, I've been trying to figure out what's the best way to explain to somebody what it is. I think one of the best ways I've come up with this is, I say to them, okay, imagine that you go to the front door, and there's like the Publishers Clearinghouse team out there, okay, and, and they're, they're throwing confetti everywhere and pouring champagne and they tell you, your ship has come in, and you're all excited, and then you find out the ship that they mean, like a one-person rubber raft, it's got patches all over, right, and the oars they give you, the one oar where the thing fans out, it's all broken off and everything, so it's Pretty much just just a straight pull, and the other oar is nothing more than like paper, so that's not going to do you any good. So, and every time you get into the to the raft, it sinks a little deeper into the water. So, that's the way I think about my attacks. Everything I do, I'm sinking just a little bit deeper in the water. One of the one of the things that causes me is time time restraint. Um, now I have to say that about 95% of the time I do it to myself because people will say you don't need to hurry, you're, we're not in a rush, you got plenty of time, but in my mind I don't, right? And that usually makes things worse. For example, if I go into a dressing room, it's like there's a big bomb there or something that I've got to diffuse, you know, and I don't have the mic in my ear, somebody telling me, cut that wire, don't cut that wire, you know, so I've got just seconds to figure this thing out, so finally I get the bomb diffused, and then I start thinking, well, geez, I'm going to be in here for a while, maybe I should have brought some provisions with me, you know, some food and some water or something, and then I start thinking, well, how am I going to make a fire in here, and how am I going to keep the wolves away at night, and then I realize, you know, I've only got one shirt to try on, so it's probably gonna, it's probably going to be okay. And then the other thing is putting my shoes on. Most of my pairs of shoes are slip-on shoes, but I do have a pair of tennis shoes that uh, I use for walking and whatnot. Now, I think most of us were taught kind of a universal way of tying our shoes. There might be a variation to this thing, but most people were taught, you take, as kids, you take the first little shoestring and you make a loop, and that becomes a solid tree, right? And you take that second shoestring and you make another loop, and that becomes the bunny rabbit. And then the bunny rabbit bounces around the tree, and he dies into the hole at the base of the tree and comes out the other side, right? That's how you were taught? Well, pretty much anymore, my tree is kind of dead and leaning over a little bit. And the bunny rabbit, uh, he got hit by a car a couple years ago. And <laughs> hit ever since, you know, a few times around over. But he doesn't so much bounce around the tree as he kind of crawls and 
stumbles and leans on the tree, and about the eighth time of circling the tree, he finds the hole. And he doesn't so much dive into the hole anymore as he just kind of lays down and crumbles into the hole, right? <laughs> so. But, but not, you know, I, I use that about the bunny rabbit, but I love animals. In fact, we have two small dogs in our house, and uh, they pretty early identified me as being the weakest link. <laughs> most of the time, I won't say all the time, but most of the time if somebody's going to spill some food, it's going to be me. And the dogs are right there at, the, at, at my feet at mealtime because they know. In fact, they're like little vacuum cleaners. In fact, I've I've, uh, I've joked around for a couple of years that I'd like to change their name to a Hoover, Kirby, Dirt Devil, something like that. You know? And I'd also like to to get uh, a handicap status so that I could take them into a restaurant. You know, they're not seeing eye dogs or anything, but I'd like to tuck one and reach around and walk into a restaurant, put them under the table. They'd clean up after me and anybody else that was there before me. <laughs> You would, you would think that that would be uh, very uh, handy for the, for the wait staff because they would back in the floor for me. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, but I uh, loved to play games. That's the other thing that I used to do when I was growing up. And I still do love to play games. But the games that I played as a kid have come just a little too close to reality for me now. Like, uh, I used to like to play Battleship. I don't know if you guys remember Battleship. You've got those two grates on there, and you, you put your ships on there, and the other person called that a number, and you got the white pegs and the red pegs, and the white ones for marking the misses, and the red ones for marking the heads. And anymore, I'm seeing a lot more red pegs in my life than I'm seeing the white pegs. And every time a number is called out, in my head, it's like, there goes another one of my physical abilities, you know, it's like, C-13, well, oh, shoot, I guess I'm not going to be able to write very clearly, you know, B-17, oh, shoot, there goes my, my uh, speech. And then another game I used to like to play was, uh, uh, oh, the name escapes me, Operation. That was one where you take the tweezers, and uh, if you touch the sides, the whole thing would, would buzz, and the little oh, man's red nose would light up. I'm hearing that buzz constantly as I bumped into the door frames, walls, furniture, and if I had a little red nose, that thing would be constantly blowing. But my favorite game growing up was called Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Yeah. Do you remember that game? Yeah. Okay, so you had two robots and a little ring, and they would punch each other, and you had two little joysticks outside the ring, and you would operate them with your thumb, right? Well, and I used to love that game, but anymore, I feel like I am one of those robots, life is the other robot, and a taxi is pretty much that happy little kid outside the ring, <laughs> pushing those buttons, you know, both while I'm I get a shot under the chin and my head zips up, you know. So, and then the one thing that I find ironic, Domino, because as kids we would see these shows where they, there'd be like a team of like 12 people and they'd spend like three weeks on this real elaborate dominoes thing and they'd knock it over and it'd take like 15 minutes and all these dominoes would be fun. You think that was so cool, so you try it. Well, as a kid, I was never able to set up like more than one domino in a row. And you would think, now, as an adult, I would be able to do that, but I can't reach into a shelf or get something off the table without setting off chain reaction. I mean, seriously, everything falls over. It's like I stayed all night, set these things up, and now I'm going for a world, world record or something, you know? I find that uh, kind of ironic and but the one thing that used to really, really bug me, and I, I, it still kind of does, but I'm getting over it, is people's perception of you when they look at you, when they look at me. Now, my ataxia is fairly sl slow and, and evolving. So, people look at me and they're like, 
they didn't understand. Why aren't you helping here? Why aren't you picking this up, you know? And, and uh, you can just see it in their eyes, they're thinking, it's because, it's because of the kind of parents you had growing up. <laughs> and they also are, are judging the kind of parent you're going to be, and they're probably casting a pretty dark shadow on the kind of grandparent you're going to be as well. You're just rude. So they used to always kind of uh, bug me, but the one thing that I decided was that I can use ataxia to my advantage. I can do things like my neurologist, I can say my neurologist suggests, like you can say, my neurologist suggests that I take a nap for two hours every day, or, or my neurologist says, my neurologist says that I shouldn't be lifting this. So my, my neurologist recommends, my neurologist recommends that I have a bigger piece of pie. So, <laughs> so Jason? Yeah. Who is your neurologist? Dr. Jordan Scott, same one? Dr. B. Yeah, Dr. B. It's the same one that Frank goes to. Yep. You go to Salem? Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I think that's all I had for today. So. <laughs>